This is a production of Cornell University. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I kind of like trailed off with my drear updates. Uh, I think I posted two, but they were pretty comprehensive. But then I just fell into a hole of insanity because we had a really, really busy year. And hopefully this makes up for it and you can hear about everything I did between uh, the last update and now. <laughs> so, um, as was said, I went to Australia to pursue my interest in grapes, wine, and relate relations to climate change. Um, and there will be lots of animal pictures in this presentation because I love animals and there's lots of cool ones in Australia. Um, so before I get into like the nitty gritty academic stuff, I thought I'd give you some fun background about other things I learned in Australia not related to viticulture. <laughs> Perhaps the scariest was how to drive a manual car on the wrong side of the road. That was terrifying. Um, I'm now trying to readjust to the right side of the road, so it's always a struggle. Um, how to live involuntarily with very large spiders that are very fast. They're called huntsmen because they run after their prey and they don't build webs, so they are just gone like that. Um, I did play one game of cricket. Uh, I was told I did a good job. I don't really understand the rules, but they told me what to do and I did it, so I played cricket. Check. <laughs> um, and how to understand Australians. What the heck are they saying? If you can abbreviate a word, they will abbreviate it. If you can't abbreviate a word, they will still manage to abbreviate it. And yeah, it's like a completely different language. So <laughs> that was interesting. So I went to Australia, as we know. Uh, here is a map showing you the wine regions of Australia. Uh, pretty big continent, lots of wine regions. I was based right, oh no, sorry, no laser. Anyway, um, I was based right here in this green area, South Australia, which is actually producing more than 50% of Australian wine. So it's the largest production area. Um, I was right here in the middle of all this at the University of Adelaide, um, smack in the middle of the wine regions of South Australia. Uh, and we had research projects up in the Riverland, which is that yellow uh, squarish area to the northeast, which is very hot, very intensive agriculture, high yielding vines. Um, and we had research sites down in the southeast in Kunawara, which is in that uh, orange region. It's a cooler climate. Um, and of course, we had work at the University Vineyard in the middle where the star is. Um, one interesting thing about South Australia is it's a quarantine area for phylloxera, so there are no phylloxera there, meaning that has some of the oldest vines in the world. Um, lots of ungrafted vines. People still graft for other reasons, but it's pretty cool to work alongside hundreds of year old vines there. And so I was working with Dr. Vinay Paget, who many, some of you here might be familiar with, absolutely incredible guy. Um, his wife, Fran, who was an amazing friend to me while I was there, and the rest of his lab, who are all wonderful people from all around the world. Um, and I had just an incredible experience with them. So um, I'll kind of break down for you what I did this year, because the Dreer Award was only supposed to be for the first half of the year, but I was there until last week. So I pretty much had a full year in Australia. Um, and I'll explain to you what that consisted of. So. Uh, in their summer fall, which is our winter spring here, I was doing the Dreer Award uh, PAGE lab intern. So just participating in all of his research projects um, all over the state of South Australia, collecting data, analyzing data, preparing publications, you name it. Um, and I also had a part-time job with the AWRI, which is the Australian Wine Research Institute. So on the weekends during harvest, I was working for them. Um, I was making small lot research wines, uh, applying treatments, basically seeing the wines through from grapes to bottle. So that was a really great experience for me because it added to my overall knowledge base of viticulture and enology. And then for the second half of the year, uh, Vinay actually took me on as his technician. Um, and that involved, you know, some taste testing of the wines that we, <laughs> in the places we were working, make sure that everything's okay. Uh, <laughs> and I was also working for the university's research vineyard as a technician. I was doing lots of practical things like driving the tractor, spraying, slashing, mowing, repairing irrigation, getting those practical skills under my belt. It was a great, awesome experience. Um, very thankful for that. 
And in between it all, I traveled and I saw lots of animals and I traveled some more and I'm really happy with all the animals I met this year. <laughs> um, and my schedule was flexible enough that it allowed me to do that, which was really great. So the million dollar question is how many projects does Benet have? Because any of you who know him know that he is like just just unstoppable, so passionate about his work, and he takes on everything. He never says no. So I can't tell you how many projects he has, even though that was kind of my job, was to know how many projects he has, because almost every week he'd be talking to me about some other project that I didn't know he had. And I was like, I thought I'm your technician. I thought I'm supposed to know these things. But there are just too many. I can't even count. But to give you a little bit of a sample, um, this is one of his new PhD students, and she's working on volatile sig signaling for drought stress in grapevines. So it's starting off as a greenhouse study. That's super interesting. Um, then we had, I wrote about this in my blog post once. Um, this is continuous sensing of grapevine water status using infrared cameras. Um, and that was down in Kunora. So he's trying to develop an index that will correlate uh, these thermal, this thermal data to vine water status. So I spent a lot of time helping on that project. Uh, that project also involves flying airplanes with multispectral cameras over the vineyards, which was super cool, and we got to see this airplane. Uh, this year in Kunawara, he has a new project on berry cell death and how that relates to berry shrivel, um, which is a concern for them down there. So this is a fluorescent a uh, microscopy image that I made of a berry that I sliced and stained, and then we run that through a computer program to see how much cell death uh, is occurring. So that's ongoing this coming year. He's still got his microtensiometer project happening, which some of you may be familiar with, which is that chip that uh, sits in the vine xylem and monitors water status continuously as well. And he's also working on hyperspectral imagery or laser hyperspectral sensing of viruses. So um, right now we have this backpack uh, contraption, but hopefully he wants to put this on a drone with a camera and just get hyperspectral images of vineyards to detect viruses. So that's just a small sample of Vinay's ongoing work that I got to participate in, which was great. And now, I am going to talk to you about a project that I worked intensively on, uh, active canopy cooling strategies to mitigate the negative effects of heat waves on grapevines. Um, and I gave this presentation a few weeks ago at the CRUSH seminar at the University of Adelaide. Um, and so, yeah, so hopefully it goes nice and smooth this time. <laughs> So back to climate change, the reason I went to Australia. Um, all over the world, obviously, agriculture is gonna have to contend with the effects of climate change. In Australia, where most wine growing regions are semi-arid and Mediterranean climates, um, we have to worry about the seasons getting hotter and drier. So we're worried about a few things not limited to compressed growing seasons, which means hotter, shorter seasons, a dual warming effect, and most models are predicting that. Uh, damage to reproductive organ development, which is the flowers, which then results in our fruit, the most important thing. Failure of flavor, flavor and aroma development, so a lot of heat can squash out those compounds that we look for in quality wine. And overall water scarcity across the board, so um, not just in viticulture, but all agricultural pursuits are going to be dealing with water scarcity. So what can we do? Because in the coming decades, I want to be like a world famous viticulturist, so I have to deal with this, right? So we have to do something. And even if we stop emitting carbon today, right now, even if we shut off all our cars and stop eating beef, we're still going to be dealing with the effects of climate change in the years to come because the climate has inertia. So at this point, the best risk management strategy is adaptation. So here's a graph that I put together of the historical occurrence of heat waves um, up in the Riverland, which was that uh, northeastern yellow area that I discussed, really, really hot, high intensity agriculture, high yields. Um, and last year, 1617, we only had four heat waves. So that's relatively fewer than in previous years, but we only expect that trend to increase um, as the, the years go by. So how do we define a heat wave for our study for this purpose? 
We define a heat wave as three days or more of 35 degrees Celsius or greater. And we arrived at that definition uh, using the Greer and Whedon paper, uh, where they showed that at that threshold, we were seeing negative effects on vine physiology and uh, wine quality, grape and wine quality. As far as active canopy cooling goes, um, the whole point of this presentation, there's not too much in the field on active canopy cooling. In the 70s in California, Algebrae and Gilbert uh, looked at overhead sprinkling and they did have some success with that, but it hasn't really been touched since. More recently, last year, Caravia at the University of Adelaide investigated in canopy cooling, so misting in the canopy. And we actually have an extension of that project happening this year that I worked on as well. Um, I'm not gonna go into that one in depth for this presentation, but I'm happy to talk about it with any of you if you're curious later. So our objectives for this work were to evaluate the vine performance during the heat waves. Uh, we looked at the canopy microclimate, so the temperature, the humidity, the vapor pressure deficit, and we looked at the effects on grape and wine quality. So we were up in the Riverland, as I said, we were working with a commercial grower uh, on Sauvignon Blanc vines, four cordon sprawl, absolutely huge vines, very high yielding. And we had these two trials at the same site right next to each other. The in canopy cooling trial, which was a misting in the canopy trial that I just mentioned, uh, but I'll talk about later if you want. And then the under canopy cooling trial, um, which is a special interest to me, and that's what we'll talk about today. So the under canopy cooling trial, or UCC, had two treatments compared to a control. The control was your traditional uh, drip line irrigation, grower controlled, uh, just your regular drip line. The under canopy sprinklers, the first treatment, or UCS, were basically broadcast sprinklers that wet the entire mid row of the vineyard floor. So under the vine, in the middle of the vine, everywhere was wet. And then the supplemental irrigation, or SI, was a bypass drip line that deposited the same volume of water, but directly under the vine. Instead of everywhere, like the UCS did, it put the same amount of water just under the vine. Oh, sorry, and the most important thing about these treatments is to keep in mind that they were on at night. So if we saw a heat wave was coming up, we would trigger the system to go on the night before and all of the nights during the heat wave, but this wasn't happening during the day. So we collected a lot of data because Vinay loves data. Um, and I am going to primarily talk to you about the data we collected on the canopy microclimate, uh, the leaf gas exchange, and the soil and plant water statuses. But don't worry, we also looked at a lot of other things. Um, so that would take me a long time to go through, but we have it. <laughs> so if you're curious. Um, and this is a picture of our ERGA, or infrared gas analyzer. Uh, it's made by Lycor. And this machine is, was initially very scary to me, but now I'm intimately acquainted with it, and I use it a lot this year. And that helps us understand uh, the photosynthesis and the stomatal conductance in the leaves. So here are some graphs I put together of the temperature and the vapor pressure deficit at the hottest part of the day during a heat wave. So this was three or more days at 35 C or greater. This particular day was over 40 Celsius, and this is the heat of the day. And the dot dash line on the bottom of both graphs is the under canopy sprinkler, or the UCS. So you can see that the temperature of the UCS treatment stayed below 40 degrees, even at the hottest part of the day. And the vapor pressure deficit was below five kilo kilopascals. Um, and remember that these treatments were on at night. So we're seeing this effect in the middle of the day, which is pretty awesome, in my opinion. Uh, and here you see basically more ideal physiological conditions for physiological function during this heat wave in the UCS treatment, while the SI and the control are much hotter and drier. Uh, here are a couple of thermal images we put together so you can kind of visualize what's happening in the mid row and the undervine. In the control, you had a really hot mid-row, 45 degrees Celsius. Uh, in the supplemental irrigation, it was cooler at 38, but it was coolest in the under canopy sprinklers at 33. And the same trend is happening um, under the vine as well. 
So now we will go into the soil and plant water status. So top graph uh, is pre-dawn water potential, my favorite measurement. Uh, three o'clock in the morning, we go out and we do pressure bombing, which is take a leaf, put it in a chamber, um, put pressure on it and see how much pressure it takes to make a drop of water come out. And in the pre-dawn, that gives us an idea of soil moisture content. So pre-dawn water potential correlates with soil moisture. So that's why we take that measurement. Then the bottom graph is midday stem water potential, uh, which gives us an idea of the plant's water status. So soil water status, plant water status. Um, and you can see, again, mid heat wave, in the middle of a heat wave, the control is the black, the supplemental irrigation is the checkered, and the under canopy sprinklers is the gray. And there are no significant differences in soil water status across any of these treatments. So we know, based on that, that we are not having an irrigation effect with these treatments. The point of this research is not to irrigate the vines, it's to actively cool them. So how can we apply water so that it has a cooling effect? It's not intended to irrigate the vines. So based on that lack of significance in the top graph, lack of difference in soil moisture, we see no irrigation effect, if you will. Then we look down at the midday water potential and we see that the control is significantly lower than the two treatments. So the control is relatively water stressed during this heat wave compared to the two treatments. But there are no differences between the SI and the UCS. So keep that in mind while we move to this slide. So again, middle of a heat wave, top graph, AN, net photosynthesis, bottom graph, GS, stomatal conductance. And you can see that the control in both the photosynthesis and the conductance has significantly lower rates for both. That's easily explained by the fact that the plant is water stressed, as we saw in the previous slide, looking at the midday stem water potential. But then, curiously, we see a difference between the two treatments for both parameters. So we can't explain the difference in photosynthesis for the two treatments based on water status, because we saw here that there was no difference in water status for the treatments. So we have to explain this somehow out, some other way. Um, we have two theories that we will, or not we, they <laughs> will investigate further this year. Unfortunately, I can't be there. But <laughs> um, the first being that perhaps because in the supplemental irrigation, the root zone is very wet, it's concentrated directly under the vine, a wet area, that abscisic acid or ABA is being translocated up from the root zone to the leaves and closing the stomata, down-regulating photosynthesis and stomatal conductance. And that might not be happening in the UCS because the water is distributed all across the vineyard floor. Another possibility is simply that the canopy microclimate in the UCS is more favorable for photosynthesis and stomatal conductance in the middle of a heat wave because we saw that it's a lot cooler and less dry, lower vapor pressure deficit um, during the heat wave. So that soil evaporation can just be promoting overall uh, more ideal conditions for canopy function during a heat wave. So as far as other results go, we saw significantly higher uh, TA or titratable acidity in the UCS and SI treatment wines. Um, so that's great because we want to preserve acidity through these heat events. Loss of acidity uh, in must or grapes after heat events is something we don't want. Um, we didn't see any differences in yield, but we can conclude that the UCS treatment is effectively cooling the canopy and promoting ideal conditions for uh, physiological function during heat waves. Um, if you ask me why I don't think we saw many more results than this this year, I think it's because uh, it wasn't such a hot year for Australia. As you saw in the first graph, there were four heat waves, which is not so much for, for this climate. And I think that in future years, when it's hotter and drier and you have more heat events, you might see these treatments start to separate in other parameters. So um, yeah, that's, that's my theory as to why there wasn't so many differences this year. Uh, in this coming season, we're going to, they're going to uh, characterize the root density and distribution and evaluate the soil moisture and temperature. Since we didn't do that last year, we really don't know what's going on underground. Um, 
are there roots in the midrow? Are they active? What is the soil temperature and moisture in those areas? Um, that can really help us hone in on our theories as to why we saw those physiological differences. Uh, and they're also going to sample abscisic acid, or ABA, at time points before, during, and after heat waves. So we can see if there's any differences in that hormone. So for this project, uh, I'd like to thank Wine Australia for their funding. Oxford Landing Estates was our cooperating grower. They did a great job. And lots of people in our lab and outside of our lab who helped on this. Um, they were awesome and they really saved, saved us. <laughs> and for this entire experience overall, I'd like to thank the Dreer Committee, uh, Nina, Marvin, John. And I have to thank Fran, Vinay, and the whole lab for just making this year beyond incredible. I learned so much. I am so grateful. And I can't say enough good things about the Dreer Award <laughs> or about Vinay and his lab because it's, they're just amazing. So um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody. Any questions? The ground and teeth, mm -hmm. and we have a, a problem with the spraying. The spraying is two, two problems. First, it uh, causes more viruses or, or parasites, you know, when the, the canopy is uh, humid mm -hmm. and the loss of water. So, we use just nets mm -hmm. to pull it down. So, they don't do it there. Yeah, time. so they're there. Can you repeat the question for Jesus? Sure, yeah. So I think the question is about uh, disease pressure with a wet canopy, is that right? Um, and you use nets to cool. So shade cloth is absolutely one option to cool your canopy. Um, there's work on that, as we know. Um, in Australia, in this very dry climate, we did not see any increase in disease pressure. Um, yeah, there was really, like, it was negligible. I think in the Finger Lakes, it wouldn't be possible to do in-canopy misting. Um, that would just, yeah, be a disaster probably here. Um, but in this hot, dry climate, it's really not even a concern. That's the first thing I thought when I got there because I'm, I was cool climate conditioned when I got over there, but uh, we didn't see any disease incidents increase with that in canopy misting project. Yeah. Does that answer it? How much water was used um, each night? Oh boy, I have to check. <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, yeah. So Connor asked me about how much water was applied at night for those treatments. Um, and I'm just going to pull up that information because I don't want to give you the wrong answer, but I have it. So it is, it's a lot of water, obviously. Um, but, you know, our, our point is to preserve or increase the quality, maintain the quality or make it better going into these really hot seasons that we're expecting. Uh, so you have to use more water, right? So what's the best way to use it? Should we just irrigate or should we try something like this, like active canopy cooling? Uh, that's, that's a valid question. Um, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to find this for you. I calibrated the system before I left, but I forgot. <laughs> um, so basically the, so the sprinklers turned on for 30 minutes every hour and a half for a total of four cycles throughout the night. Um, and the flow rate was 57 liters per vine per night. And then, yeah, for the, for the whole year, um, in the under canopy sprinkler treatment, the water application for the season was 5.6 megaliters per hectare. If you compare that to the grower irrigation, the grower irrigation is 7.7 7 megaliters per hectare. So does that give you some context? Kind of, yeah. So how long does the misting uh, cooling down effect last? So do you, you, you turn on the mist mm -hmm. at night and then do, during the day 
when does it dry up or does the yeah. temperature increase during the day? So for this under canopy um, cooling trial, so this is not the in canopy misting trial that I like briefly mentioned, but for this under canopy trial, you can see that the temperature was maintained throughout the day. Um, for the in canopy misting, which I did not present the data on, the temperature dropped very quickly, five to eight degrees Celsius in the canopy, but then it came back up almost immediately. And so this year, they're going to tweak that and try to, they're modeling it and trying to see like what is the optimal frequency and duration of misting to maintain the canopy temperature at or below 35 C. That's the goal, ideally. So, so my follow-up question is, if you uh, give the vines uh, a sense of, yeah, it's not so hot, and then they open their stom somata and do the photosynthesis, because of the chemical response, uh, as you mentioned in the rules, the ABA and mm -hmm. stuff, and then when it get really hot, but then they, they still open their somata and they lose their water, would that be uh, something to consider uh, negative effect? I don't think so, because when we have these really intense heat events, the vines are often shutting down, right? So they're stopping physiological function. Um, and then you might be losing some of your desirable components in the grapes, aroma compounds and whatnot. Um, actually, when we harvested this trial, the cooperating grower was supposed to harvest just about the same time as us, but they held off uh, almost a week and a half to two weeks after because we harvested right after a heat wave and they wanted to wait for the vines to build up more sugar because they had kind of just shut down at that point. So we're worried about like hotter, shorter seasons and faster ripening, but we're also worried about vines just quitting when it's too hot, right? And then loss of those desirable characteristics in your grapes and wine during those really high heat events. Look up, check with Ginger and see if they have any questions. How do I do that? Oh, you just have to say Geneva. Hi, Geneva, do you have any questions? <laughs> We're here. One question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Raquel. This is Tim Martinson. Hi, Tim. Um, yeah. Uh, can you comment on, uh, you know, given the water shortage and the droughts that they have, what are what is the industry in general doing to address the the water shortage? Are they using different uh, methods of scheduling irrigation, or what, what, what's the response been to the drought in general? It's really, oh, first, well, first of all, last year was actually not a drought at all. It was a very wet year okay. for Australia. Um, so while I was there, that's not a good example because they had more rain in their growing season than we had in our 2016 growing season, which is pretty okay. incredible. Um, but, um, I, I was pretty amazed to tell you the truth about the lack of a consistent response to these drought events or irrigation in general. Um, you know, a lot of our cooperating growers were asking Vinay, like, what, what do we do? Like, how do we, how do we schedule? Like, when do we irrigate? You know, we go by like, touching the leaves or visual clues or something, right? And so it was really amazing to see that there is like a lack of knowledge that will allow them to respond to this. Uh, and so that's exactly like what he's working on, right? So it was, okay. it was great to see that our work is very needed there. Um, and it was really a grower by grower, um, like everyone had their own response really turn on the irrigation, I don't know, they'll be okay. Oh, the leaves look a little hot and tilted away from the sun. Maybe we should turn it on now. So it was really not consistent. And you and Australian viticulture and winemaking overall, I think is very technology savvy. Um, and they're really on the cutting edge, I think. But the fact that they didn't have a consistent response was just, yeah, wow. Like we need this work, right? Really so needs to be done. Are they not using regulated deficit irrigation or partial root zone drying? Those were developed in Australia <laughs> and they're not using them. You know, I didn't see any partial root zone drying there personally, um, but I think some people use it. None of the sites that I visited were doing anything like that. But uh, yeah, there's RDI. But in terms of 
people are really at a loss as to like what the best route going forward is for irrigation scheduling um, and dealing with these heat events. Yeah, that's that's my honest perception. You know, someone someone could tell me otherwise, but I I heard it from more than one grower, and I was amazed. Hey, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, so I'm not making this argument, but how would you respond to to this argument that? Look, climate's getting hotter. We're running out of good water. Is this really a good use of our scarce resources? And at one point, should we kind of pull the plug on trying to grow grapes in Australia anyways? And how can we do this more sustainably longer? Like, what's the logic there? Yeah, it's a valid question. I mean, I'm not prepared personally to give up my Australian wine <laughs> because I think that <laughs> there, there is recourse, right? But I don't know. I think agriculture in Australia needs to undergo some changes as a whole. Like, they're still growing rice in this same region of Australia. Like, that is ridiculous, right? Having rice patties in the outback, essentially. So not to be like... I don't know, specious, but I would prioritize um, improving <laughs> grape quality over growing rice in the almost Australian outback. Um, and the whole point of this is to see, you know, how can we do it as efficiently as possible? We're going to need more water, but how should we apply it, right? And what will make the biggest difference for our quality uh, with using the, less wa the least water possible? Is that... Is that a sufficient yeah, answer, Zach? Thank, thank, thank <laughs> yeah. you. There's, I don't think there's like a one a right answer for that. I'm just curious yeah. your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, you, you you spray you uh, emigrate water directly to the roots uh, to decrease the temperature, uh, right? So do I do we irrigate the roots to decrease temperature? Uh, I mean. So, uh, you use water, you, you irrigate water to decrease the temperature under the canopy uh, to decrease the temperature of the plants, right? Correct. So we, so, okay, so the question I think was, we are applying water under the canopy to decrease the temperature of the canopy of the vines. Uh, spring water to the whole plants on that directly. Uh, just so okay so there were two like I said before there were two experiments um, there was the in canopy cooling experiment which is misters inside the canopy and then there was this under canopy cooling experiment which was misting on the vineyard floor right so it's two separate experiments um, and this one under canopy cooling was applying water broadcast to the vineyard floor and this one in canopy cooling had misters inside the canopy. Uh, Does that make sense? Okay, uh, I mean, in the canopy, it was spray water directly to the plants. Yeah, it was like it was a sprayer system in the canopy. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so have you have been looking at the the root turnover rate? Yeah. So Anne wants to know if we're looking at the root turnover rate in the under canopy sprinkler treatment. Um, so we actually haven't looked at anything below ground yet. So this coming year is going to be all about what's, yeah, what's going on underground because we know almost nothing about that. And that could be the key to explaining a lot of this. I'm really clear about that. Same. Uh, <laughs> I'll let you know when they tell me. <laughs> and also, what about the hormone and the for EPA and gas machine? I don't know about the analysis method, but basically when we, oh, sorry, Geneva, she asked me what method uh, of ABA analysis we're using. So I'm not sure about the, chemical analysis of it, but how we collect it, or we will collect it, is, um, is when we do the pressure bomb, so when we do that midday stem water potential, and you have the leaf in the chamber, and the water droplet comes out of the yeah. stem, we're going to pipette that into a little vial. You only need, I think, a tiny amount 
a um, farmer's method. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much. For yeah, you're welcome. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.